Good evening, virtual audience, and welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Marisa LaFleur, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm very pleased to introduce this event with Christina Chu and Pam Houston, presenting their books, Beauty, a Novel, and Deep Creek, Finding Hope in the High Country, respectively. Through virtual events like tonight's, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our community and our new digital community during these unprecedented times. Every week we will be hosting events here on our Zoom account. As always, our event schedule also appears on our website at harvard.com events, where you can sign up for our email newsletter and browse our bookshelves from home. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for our speakers at any time during the talk tonight, click on the Q&A button, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen, and we'll get through as many as time allows. Also in the chat, I'll be posting links to purchase Beauty and Deep Creek on harvard.com, as well as a link to donate in support of this series and Harvard Bookstore. Your purchases and financial contributions make events like tonight's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore. So thank you so much for showing up and tuning in in support of our authors and the incredible staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore. We really appreciate your support now and always. And finally, as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings these last few months, technical issues may arise. If they do, we'll do our best to resolve them quickly. Thank you in advance for your patience and understanding. And now I'm so pleased to introduce tonight's speakers. Christina Chu is an award-winning author and founding member of the Asian American Writers Workshop. Her first book, Troublemaker and Other Saints, was nominated for several awards and received the Asian American Literary Award. Additionally, her stories have appeared in Tin House, the New Guard Literary Review, Washington Square, and elsewhere, and she curates and co-hosts the Pen Parentis Literary Salon, a nonprofit organization that provides resources to authors who are also parents to keep them on creative track after starting a family. Her latest novel, Beauty, earned her the grand prize of the James Allen McPherson 2040 Book Award. It, uh, it follows an up-and-coming New York fashion designer facing chauvinism, prejudice, and struggles with marriage and motherhood. Selected as one of the most anticipated titles of 2020 by The Millions, Beauty is a novel described by The Hour's author, Michael Cunningham, as beautiful in the way of a scalpel blade. It's that sharp and precise, that lacerating, that true. Pam Houston is also an award-winning author and professor of English at UC Davis. She also teaches in the Low Res MFA program at the Institute of American Indian Arts and is co-founder and creative director of the literary nonprofit, Writing by Writers. Her previous works include two novels, Contents May Have Shifted and Sight Hound, two collections of short stories, and a collection of essays. Her stories have been selected for volumes of the O. Henry Awards, the Pushcart Prize, Best American Travel Writing, and Best American Short Stories of the Century, among other anthologies. Her new memoir, Deep Creek, Finding Hope in the High Country, won the 2019 Reading the West Advocacy Award and recounts her experiences learning to care for her 120-acre homestead in the Colorado Rockies, including the land and the creatures on it, and explores what ties her to the earth, both at home and in her travels. The Minneapolis Star Tribune writes that, Houston here lets truth tell the story she wants to tell, and they are quietly stunning, but also provocative in the contradictions she poses. We're so pleased to have them both here with us tonight. Without further ado, the digital podium is yours, Christina and Pam. Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna read a few pages from um, a story called Black Lace and Blue Secrets. Um, just in case, I'm just gonna let you know, um, the main character's name is Amy. Um, she has a son, um, Alex, and a granddaughter, who is um, Catherine and a boyfriend who is Cameron, just, just so you know, because uh, this is, it's pretty late in the book. Black Lace and Blue Secrets. You like, I say, as m my one and only grandchild, Catherine, joins me in the living room to inspect my latest creation, a lace-up three-inch ankle boot. The quarters are made of a gunmetal sequin fabric the front vamp, a black suede, the laces, a thick satin. 
Oh, Catherine says, holding the right boot. She settles on the red opium bed, which I doubled up with soft, thick padding, and examines my workmanship. They turned out beautifully, she says. Trey couture, don't you think? I say. Deaf. I ask for a pair, but I've already got something else in mind, she says. Pray tell, mademoiselle, I say. I return the boot back to the top shelf with its partner. My apartment is unusual in that my bookshelves are filled with shoes and boots instead of books. And except for the first real pair of boots I've ever purchased, a black lace knee-high stiletto, all were crafted since I retired 10 years ago. Uh-oh, where'd I go? They include Catherine's first pair of shoes, hot pink Mary Janes, ballet flats, and lace-up riding boots. After a long and frightful Doc Martin stage during, which her, during her high school years, elegance and beauty finally came back into vogue. Catherine took to placing shoe orders with me, expressing ideas to add her own unique twist to things. Your wish is my command, I tell her. I've got something I need to tell you first, she says, beating me to the punch. The purpose of calling her here is to discuss the company. Alex is in his 50s now. He isn't young anymore. It's time she learned the business. Catherine giggles. Whatever she has to say, it must be serious. I haven't heard her giggle since she was a teenager prone to crushes. She pats the seat beside her. Come, Grandma, sit with me. I get this unsettling feeling that I'm, up, I'm being lowered into a lion's den. Catherine is following in her pup-pup's footsteps. She's a star at FIT and already noticed in the industry. Her work at school was picked up by Couture Culture. The Spring Line received rave reviews. The buzz got her into some trendy New York boutiques and then one of her A-line dresses appeared in vogue. Is she planning an, a, a new line, I wonder? Does she need capital? I'm not so keen on surprises, I say. Just sit, Grandma. She smiles, teeth clenched with excitement. The red bed is up against the window with a view of the Hudson. I sit turned toward her. She takes my hands in hers, and that's when I notice a ring two carat, emerald cut, platinum, pave frame. But all the disappointments in my life flash in front of me like a massive karmic flip book. And in one single stroke, my hopes and expectations for Catherine are suddenly dashed. How can this be? She's 21, the same age Jeff was when he first got noticed. Suddenly, the glare from outside hurts my eyes. I'm engaged, she chirps, wiggling her fingers out in front of her. The diamond catches the light and sparks rainbows across the walls and ceiling. I feel as if I got sucker punched. There's an ache in my heart, and yet I'm strangely numb to it. Catherine, however, chatters on. Vanessa invited friends over for, for her birthday, and when I asked who brought the Tiffany. She said she didn't know she'd have to open it. So she did. And I was like, wow, what the hell? And before I knew it, she was on her knee proposing. And at first I had no idea what was even going on. Catherine laughs. And then she says it's her birthday and there's nothing she'd love more than for me to be her wife. My darling Catherine, all that potential lost. She could follow in her grandfather's footsteps or mine. And now I see she is choosing mine. Catherine continues on about her wedding, something about a tent affair and the dress she's going to make, gesticulating with her arms as she describes the bodice. It's going to be strapless with a silk corset on top, sort of like a mini with layers of feathery lingerie chiffon up the, mid, the, up the mid thigh. So lots of leg. And then this awesome feathery train, you know? 
I nod as if I'm listening. On clear sunny days, the Hudson appears liquid silver. Sunlight glints off the river. With the help of a new experimental treatment, Jeff defied the odds and remained, remained stage three of the condition for the next 10 years, finally passing as a result of pneumonia brought on by an upper respiratory infection. He left a quarter of his assets to each of his three children and the last fourth to me. With it, I bought this apartment. You'll design a pair of boots for the wedding, she asks. Hmm? Boots. She extends her long legs. Short, maybe ankle, and lace? Definitely lace. Floral or mesh? Floral. No, 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 mesh. I don't know. Three inch? Four? Platform? Yes, she nods. Oh, and black. The dress is black. As long as it's not black and blue, I say. I mean it jokingly, yet as soon as the words leave my mouth, I feel the ache expanding in my chest. My life, hers, repeating patterns, karma. Is there a lesson to be learned from this? A way to change this in consciousness? What's wrong, Grandma, she asks, taking my hand. Nothing, I say. You sure? Because you don't look very happy. I thought you would be happy for me. Of course I am, sweetheart, I say. But even as I say it, a voice inside, inside says, there's no fucking way. Who do you think you are? It's just, I sandwich her hand in mine. Isn't marriage a little outdated these days? I mean, the notion itself? Oh, grandma. Half of them fail, I say. I don't need to mention her own parents. Her mother remains bitter and alone while Alex has remarried and started a new life with, with a woman half his age. Catherine frowns at me. I shrug. I'm just saying. Look, looks like you've got some interesting beliefs about marriage, Grandma, she says, crossing her arms and trying to sound as if she were me. I should know, I say, I've done it twice. So no more, she says, that right? Exactly. She glances outside, then back at me, and point blank says, so is that what happened with Cameron? Cameron is the man I've just broken things off with. We'd been seeing each other for the past three years. We initially met through the master's class, but got to know one another better at a Buddhist meditation retreat. Marriage, the idea of it, makes must be in the air. I'm 78 years old. I'm too old for that business, I say. And I'm too young, right, she says. Uh, actually, yes, you are. She shakes her head. I never thought I'd hear you say you were too old for anything, she says. Well, there's always a first time, I say. She sighs. For what it's worth, I really liked Cameron. I cross my arms. He's a good man. What's that supposed to mean, she says. Are you looking for a hidden agenda here? Because this would be where you back off, I tell her, as much as I love you. No, Grandma, she says. I'm simply asking what it means. You're the one who tells me all the time to question my beliefs and ask if they are serving, my, serving me. It would be a shame if one stood in the way of you experiencing the true love of your life. So you've determined he's the true love of my life now, have you, I say? I feel my blood pressure spike. Isn't he, she says? If you really need to know, Cameron doesn't believe in Viagra, I say. Catherine's eyes bulge. TMI, she says, making a T with her hands. You asked, I say. She fidgets with the ring. Do you actually think people stop fucking when they get older? Or is it that you think orgasm is reserved only for the young, I say. I don't know, sort of, I guess, she says. She blushes. 
She catches my gaze and all of a sudden, we're laughing until tears are flowing from our eyes. It takes a few minutes to gather myself. No, seriously, Catherine, you're doing so well. What's all the rush? She smiles. There's an earnestness about it that feels deadly. We want to start a family, she says. My heart, everything, stops. What is wrong with this younger generation? They have the freedom to choose who and what they want to be, what they want to do, where they want to go, everything my generation of women fought against. They embraced like shit got turned to diamonds. What about your career, I ask. What about it, she says. Your father and I think it's time you join JJ, I say. Why would I do that, she says. I want to have my own line. The two are not mutually exclusive, I say. The company could use your creative talent. I don't know, Grandma. Think about it, Catherine. Your father's not getting any younger. In five or ten years, he'll be handing the reins over to you. What if I don't want it, she says. Not want it, I yell. This is your grandfather's legacy. Okay, I'll think about it, she says. Think long and hard, Catherine. The decisions you make now can impact your entire career, your life. Oh, Grandma, career and family aren't mutually exclusive either. Do you really think it's so easy to juggle kids in a career just like that? Of course not, she says. Have you given any thought, any thought at all, to who will take care of the kids while you're working? Vanessa will help, she says. Vanessa is an academic with two published books, one about politics of beauty and the other about feminism and fashion, who teaches in the women's studies department at Columbia. I thought her feminist, feminism, intelligence, and prudence would eventually butt up against Catherine's unwavering, unpracticality, and unbridled creative passion. If Catherine gets an idea to do something, it could be designing a dress made from safety pins. Everything else gets dropped until she successfully completes or totally fails at the task. From my viewpoint, what makes them such an incredible couple is how driven they both are to succeed in their careers. And I assumed, wrongly I now realize, that the success of both their careers took priority over all else. Wouldn't it be possible for Catherine to succeed as a fashion icon in her own right before squelching her energy and attention by focusing on marriage and children? At her age, I had assumed I could have it all too. And look where it got me. A few golden years before retirement, and even that only because of Jeff. I was lucky. You don't really like her, do you, Catherine says. That's not true, and you know it, I say. She's one of the most comfortable people to be around, and I love her brains. Well, I love her heart, she says, and maybe it's the way she says it but I can actually feel the depth of her connection to Vanessa. Catherine has my eyes, and with the lash extensions, her beauty can be overwhelming. But she's a third generation master and having been given the tools as a child, moves fearlessly through life without the resistance older people tend to have. At the workshop, we're reminded that we are source beings. Catherine doesn't need reminding. She already is. Even now, I can feel her using one of the techniques to calm me down. Despite her own emotions, there is no judgment or anger or even frustration, only light and compassion. And her attention, her appreciation for the struggle I am creating shifts me out of the upset and fills me with, a war with warmth and love. God damn it, I say. It's infuriating that you're using the techniques against me. She smiles. You're happy for me, aren't you? Yes, sweetheart, I am. I brush the hair from Catherine's face, and even though my heart is breaking, 
I can appreciate her both fully and deeply. Here is the most beautiful creation in my life. Then I see her. I see myself. I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, thank you, Christina. It was wonderful to hear that chapter. Um, I'm going to read from Deep Creek and um, I will read from a chapter called The Season of Hunkering Down. I've cut some pieces out of it to make it shorter, so I hope it makes sense. Um, but I'll say briefly that this book is about my life on the ranch and the way the ranch healed me. And um, when we first started writing it, when I first started writing it, <laughs> um, my editor and my agent and I were all pretty committed to just staying at the ranch all the time and having it just be about ranch life. And then that didn't work out. And I had to bring in um, some of my personal history, which I, you know, I had written all those books already, I thought, but it turned out I hadn't. So I added some things and this chapter is a, a, an indicator of how the book moves back and forth between the ranch and, um, and my earlier life. It's called The Season of Hunkering Down. By the 1st of October, the aspens are done showing off for the year. First dusting of snow on the peaks, then first dusting of snow on the pasture. The color is almost gone and with it, the tourists. My neighbors from the soured ranch have moved into town for the winter. For the next seven months, I'll be the last occupied house on my road. The horses hang around the corral, looking a little grim. They know what's coming. I've all but missed this year's color change in the high country. So even though there's much to be done to prepare for winter, this morning Fenton, William and I take a hike up to Phoenix Park one of the most wind protected places in the valley, hoping to find a few groves of aspens still holding their leaves. We climb for an hour in light drizzle and under my boot soles is a carpet of green and gold. We surprise a mule deer buck, a four pointer, at the place where the forest gives way to meadow. When we reach the waterfall at the top of the park, the sun peeks through the clouds just long enough to turn the whole scene Kodachrome. The heavy gunmetal sky, the ghost aspens with only a fraction of their leaves left glowing like a fluorescent pencil sketch beneath it, the water tumbling down the face of the cliff, beads of it lit up against the dark rock and spinning earthward like fireflies. Years ago on an August hike, right at the tail end of the monsoon, I got caught in a thunderstorm halfway across the big meadow that leads to Phoenix Park. I was new to the valley and had not yet learned how a bright white micropuff in one corner of the sky can morph into a cumulonimbic monster in the amount of time it takes to go around a couple bends in the trail. If you've never gotten caught in a thunderstorm at high altitude, if you've never felt your long straight hair stand on end as if someone above you has strings attached to it, if you've never smelled sulfur in the air just before a crack you can feel at the center of your rib cage splits the sky in two, if you've never run between lightning bolts that are hitting the ground on every side of you, your brain racing to determine whether you will improve or diminish your odds of survival if you take five seconds to unbuckle your pack and throw its contents, including your stainless steel water bottle to the ground, then you might not understand what a pleasure it is to hike that same trail in October on a cool, dry day when the odds of a thunderstorm, while not impossible, are nearly 10,000 to one. After a snack and a long drink out of that same time-tested steel water bottle, the dogs and I make our way back down the trail smelling not sulfur, but the slow rot of dying leaves in a dry climate and the occasional tang of pine pitch. An immature bald eagle rides a thermal down canyon and it's windless enough that I can hear sun-warmed rocks, newly freed from last night's frost, slip and settle in the big scree field across the creek that rises up toward Wasson Park. In the house I grew up in, fall marked the start of the most dangerous season. My mother dreaded the snow and ice and the perpetually gray skies of a mid-Atlantic winter. Either she never learned how to buy a serious winter coat or her vanity wouldn't allow it. She played indoor tennis, but reservations were expensive and in high demand, so she didn't get enough exercise for her to justify the few food calories a day she normally ingested and her perpetual hunger was the loudest thing in our house. The shortening days meant she drank more and started earlier. 
By the end of September, she was headed into a tailspin from which she would not emerge until the crocuses came up in the spring. By the time my mother died in 1993, the drug Prozac had been taken by more than 10 million people, and yet I don't believe the word depression had ever been uttered in my childhood home until once during fall break of my junior year of college, I told my mother I had started taking advantage of Denison's free psychological services. A boy I had befriended from my geology class was showing strong self-destructive tendencies. He'd just left a severed pig's head in the ice machine of the all-female dorm, and I'd made the appointment hoping to get advice on how I might help him. After giving me advice, the therapist, a kind, smart, and soft-spoken man by the name of Jeff Pollard, asked simply, and how are you feeling these days? I felt my body go utterly still for the count of one, two, three, and then I burst into sobs that lasted upward of 10 minutes. I can still feel that office around me as if it were yesterday, the leather books, tall ceilings, and high windows through which I could see all the trees on the quad ablaze in fall color. I can still feel my dawning understanding that therapy was a thing that had been invented to, among other applications, help people who had suffered exactly the sorts of things I had suffered at the hands of my father. Even then, it had taken many sessions for Dr. P to convince me it was okay to accept that help. My mother and I were driving back from an unsuccessful trip to the mall. I had arrived at my parents' house wearing a peasant blouse and a long, colorful, hand-painted skirt I'd bought more than I I'd bought for more than I could afford at an art fair. She said the skirt made me look fat and we'd go buy something she could stand to look at me in. I had fended off several pencil skirts and dart heavy blouses, as well as several items designed by Liz Claiborne. There it is, Christina, there's our intersection. <laughs> we, we hadn't exactly stopped speaking to each other. So after 10 minutes of car silence, I decided to tell her about Dr. P. He says, I suffer from PTSD, which manifests in bouts of depression and low-level anxiety. But the good news is he doesn't think I'll need drugs. He thinks the talking will work. My mother kept her eyes on the road, but I saw the corner of her mouth twitch slightly. I wasn't sure about it at first, I said, but now each week I find myself looking forward to the hour I spend in his office. I fiddled with my seatbelt. Dr. P says, I'm learning to hear the sound of my own voice. Depression, huh? My mother said, louder than I expected. I'd been hoping she'd ask me what the letters PTSD stood for. You know what we did for depression when I was your age? Drank, I managed not to say. Drank, she said, eyes <laughs> shooting to the car clock, confirming that we were, in fact, at least 30 minutes past cocktail hour. Back at the ranch after our hike, I give a couple of hours to one of the larger fall projects, coating the exterior logs with UV protector. At 9,000 feet at this latitude, the UV eats through everything over the course of a summer. Paint, plastic, enamel, and if I don't reprotect them every fall, the logs themselves. The instructions on the giant can warn it takes the coating 24 hours to seal correctly, and during that 24 hours, it must not encounter rain, dew or temperatures below 40 degrees. It always gets below 40 degrees at the ranch at night, except sometimes in July during the monsoon. If we're not in a drought year, it dews heavily every night until everything freezes solid. Given the impossibility of following the instructions on the can, I slap some coating on the logs in the heat of every afternoon and hope to get the whole house covered before the snow flies. The air at the ranch is thin, dry, and cold, and the snowstorms get stuck in the dip and swirl of the basin, turning back and back again on themselves, sometimes dropping as much as four inches an hour. On any given morning from the 1st of October on out, I might wake to frozen ground and flurries. By dinner time, the split rail fences might have all gone under, and I might not see the tops of them again until March. That will be the day that launches four solid months of worry. For my elderly geldings, Deseo and Roni, who get so stiff standing on that frozen moonscape with their achy old man legs, they sometimes won't eat, won't even take the short walk to the water trough. For the mini donkeys, Simon and Isaac, who are far younger than the horses, but no taller than the split rail fences. In the biggest blizzards, they have to power through the pasture like Tonka trucks, leaving their belly marks in the fresh powder. I spend too many hours imagining them high-centered in a drift some howling night, their little legs spinning and spinning, but gaining no purchase at all. 
What edges out the worry, of course, is the wonder. Because what could be better than 48 inches in 24 hours? Than a couple of Irish wolfhounds leaping through bottomless powder with giant smiles on their faces. Than a herd of 200 elk making their stately way chest deep in the snowbound pasture toward the river. Best of all, what accompanies each snowstorm is the knowledge that the aquifer is getting replenished, that summer wildfire fear is assuaged, if not abated, that the rivers will be full of trout and the pastures full of flowers come July. The autumn I was 25, I flew from graduate school in Utah to my parents' house in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, something I did with relative consistency up until my mother died. Downstairs in the TV room, my father and I were watching the Phillies get beat up by the Mets when the phone rang and my mother answered it upstairs. A few minutes later, we heard her banging around with some fervor. My father leaned toward me, said, go see what your mother's up to, will you? In her bedroom, she was packing a small suitcase. What's going on, I asked her. That was Jean, my mother said, without looking at me. Jean, as in your sister, I asked. In the quarter century I had been on the planet, I had maybe heard my mother say her sister's name five times. Yeah, she said. My father's dying in a hospital in Florida and he says he wants to shake my hand. I looked at my mother for signs of fracture, but as she gathered her makeup into a little cloth case with red foxes printed on it, she seemed exactly as she had been before. If my mother had mentioned Jean five times in my life, it was five more times than she had talked about her father. The story I'd been told was on the very same day my mother's mother died in childbirth, my father abandoned the girls. Aunt Ermie and Uncle Marion, who had never wanted anything to do with children, agreed to raise them. Less than a year after my mother ran away to Broadway, Jean joined her as a way to get out of their sad and angry house. They had a sister act at first and eventually went abroad with USO. Even though Jean was older, my mother had always been the wilder sister. When showbiz got too unruly for Jean, she returned to Spiceland, Indiana, found religion, and married her high school sweetheart. My mother had told me but only once that Jean never forgave my mother for corrupting her, for luring her to the big city, for tainting her reputation and ruining her life. The sisters stopped speaking when Jean returned to Indiana, and as far as my father or I knew, this was the first time Jean had made contact in more than 40 years. So what are you gonna do, I asked, though the suitcase was making the answer apparent. I'm going down there, she said. I've never laid eyes on the man and this is my last chance. You want me to go with you or drive you to the airport? No, no, stay here. Get your father to take you out to dinner. I won't be gone that long. The next day at nearly the same hour, the Mets taking it to the Phillies once again, my father and I heard the garage door open. My mother climbed the stairs without glancing in our direction and my father indicated with his head. By the time I got to her room, she was already unpacking. How'd it go? I asked her, what happened? She looked at, she looked at me as if I were crazy. What do you think happened? She said, I shook his hand. And with that, she turned back to her suitcase. I went downstairs to watch the ninth inning. A few minutes later, we heard her in the kitchen, starting dinner, humming one of her old torch songs mixing herself a drink. I finished coating nearly the entire west side of the house with an hour to go before sunset. If I extend my ladder fully and stand on the second step from the top, I can reach all but the four logs closest to the peak and those logs are protected from the worst of the sun's rays by the roof's eaves anyway. Because I have not successfully taught William to dial 911, I leave it each year at that. About six months and four cords of wood from now, there will be an April night so warm it will seem like overkill to build a fire. The next morning, I will open the windows to air out my bedroom and closet. I will hear the hum and whir of the automatic pump in the basement as it gets to work on the water that has inevitably seeped inside as 120 acres of snow turns to liquid and then tries to displace itself. I will trade my snowshoes for my extra tufts because almost overnight the pasture will have turned from mostly snow to mostly muck. As I zigzag across it, trying to stay out of the deepest mud, I will spot a flash of blue so simultaneously bright and deep it won't quite make sense in this late winter color scheme of bare branches, dusky clouds, and dirty ice. The Rocky Mountain bluebirds will have arrived, only the males at first, scouting my pasture for a nesting place. 
I'll watch the bluebirds flit along the fence line, hear the warble high and clear, and I'll know the 35 below zero nights are over, that there will be one more big dump of snow so heavy the horses will go on a water strike rather than slog through it to the trough, but it will melt in a matter of days. And before too long, there will be tiny buds on the aspen trees. The ice-choked river will run free again, and a green so subtle I think I might be imagining it will tint first the yard, then the pasture. The horses' spines will relax all the way to their tails, the chickens will venture out of the coop, and even the coyotes' barks will seem lazier, a little less hungry, a little less lonely. The wild iris will push up through the soil, and the roan, whose winter coat is burgundy wine, will shed out to a bright, barely speckled gray. In a matter of weeks, the paint-by-number landscape will have filled in around that first flash of blue, pale green aspen leaf, crimson paintbrush, purple lupin, red-tailed hawk. A few days after we talked about depression, my mother came into my room while I was sleeping, took the hand-painted skirt out of my closet, washed it in hot water, took the waistband in, and then returned it without a word. When I went to put it on for my return flight, all the beautiful colors were muted and it was a length that had never been and would never be in style. I put my jeans back on and stuck my head in her bedroom with the skirt in my hand. Why can't you like me the way I am? I leaned against the door jam, trying to look calm. There were rules against such questions in my household and I knew it. Is that the kind of thing they teach you to say in therapy, she said. I guess maybe it is, I said. Her eyes were focused, as usual, on herself in her makeup mirror. I gave up everything I loved for you, she said, for maybe the 500 millionth time. I'm sorry, I said, and I was. There were so many things that made my mother sad. The weather, my wardrobe, the choices she made, most notably, it turned out, having me. I want to write here that I understand that I know she did her best, that there was no one in her early life to teach her how to love, how to take responsibility, how to be something other than a victim of the circumstances life had dealt her. And as I write the words, I can see that they are true. But the other thing I need to say is this, for all of my childhood and throughout my teens, I prayed to have myself sucked right back up into the ether because I thought it might give my mother back her hopes and dreams and joy, but the universe wouldn't make that trade with me. And so my mother died, drunk and unhappy, and I found my way to this ranch, this place where I protect and am protected by animals, this place where nature controls how I spend my days and how I spend my life, this place where I can love every season. When the sun sets tonight, the temperature will drop in 30 minutes from 55 to 38. They're calling for a cold front to move through the valley, and if they're right, tonight we'll get our first truly hard frost. I've got a pot of green chili stew on simmer, and the dogs are snoring by the wood stove. There's nothing I would trade this for. Now, let it snow. <laughs> that was so wonderful. It was Thank really you. so wonderful. It's such a beautifully written book. Um, you know, you're you're such a master at short stories. How like how did you even decide you were going to write this memoir? Like I know you have two other books between, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I have two novels that are basically in pieces. So like they're sort of novels and stories. So I was I was kind of working on the long form in fiction before this, and this this memoir was really my editor's idea you know she wanted me to write it eight years ago when everyone wanted to buy memoirs because it wasn't supposed to take me eight years to write it but um you know she had said to me um i want you to go on a book length adventure and write about it and so i thought about i'm an adventuring sort i thought about adventures i could go on i thought well maybe i'll mush dogs to a pole, you know, or maybe I'll sail the coast of Turkey or something. And then I just realized I was driving home from teaching in Davis and I was like, oh, I'm already on my book length adventure. You know, this ranch is my book length adventure. And so that's what got me into it. But I'll tell you what, it was hard. It was hard to write memoir. 
it was hard. I really found like, you know, in fiction, there's all this explosion. Like if you get bored for a second, you can just make something happen. You can blow up a car or have a sexy Italian walk by, or like you can always make something happen. And in memoir, you kind of have to wait for the meaning to saturate. And it, it was hard. It was hard. It took a long time, but I'm glad I did it. I, I, I feel good about doing it. And I feel good about honoring this place. But it was much harder for me than writing fiction. It's not my natural way of being. How large is your um, ranch? 120 acres. Wow, that's like, that's like Manhattan. <laughs> <laughs> no, not quite. <laughs> not quite. I can walk to the back of my property in 15 minutes. So I can't walk to the end of Manhattan in 15 minutes. But it is, it's a lot of land to take care of. Yeah, for sure. Wow. So when I chose that chapter, I didn't even think about, I mean, like it's probably the one place in the book where I talk about clothes and I didn't, I mean, maybe, maybe subconsciously I chose it, but um, I do think our books intersect on the point of, um, you know, women trying to make it in a place where women are mistreated, right? I mean, our books intersect along a feminism line and also sort of overbearing and strange unemotional parents <laughs> or emotional in strange ways, right? Mm -hmm. um, your character has, um, has a, a, an intense mother and so does mine, <laughs> my character who happens to be me in this book. Um, so I wonder, you know, going around talking about the book and going around talking about the book in these times, these times of so much misogyny being spewed by the government, et cetera. Like, how has it been? Like, how has your relationship with the book grown or changed or deepened? Or do you feel, I, how, how does that gone? I feel that um, it's so important. I mean, I don't feel like my, you know, I'm so important, whatever, but I, I feel like um, there's so much we haven't said yet, right? And, there's so much we haven't said the way we want to say it. And for me, that was the challenge that um, took me so long. And having it now, I feel like the book says so much that I have never been able to express and articulate. And um, it's really hard not to feel powerless when the, the world around you is um, splitting at the seams. Mm -hmm. But I think when you put a book out there that has, that shows all these different views and, and you give people a range they haven't seen before or don't want to see, mm -hmm. you know, you know, it, it kind of, it, it makes it real mm -hmm. versus people you know having like an idea yeah oh yeah people get raped i guess but right. no people get raped you know right. so yeah so i i i i just love the book so much and when people read it i always feel like i hope he loves the book as much as me i hope she you know y you know i mean it's well one thing i love about your book is that you know, I mean, this is a time, it seems to me more than any other time before, where we have to see the deep complication in things. I mean, you know, I'm someone who doesn't know how to dress, <laughs> you know, I'm someone who doesn't wear makeup. I live out here on this ranch. I'm covered with mud half the time. So it would be easy for me to be like, oh, you know, women in the fashion industry are just buying into the patriarchy, right? And they're selling out to like this idea that men are in control of us and you know, so many things like that. And that's why I loved reading your book. And I love the sort of accidental way your book came to me because it's probably not a book I would have necessarily read also because it's an East Coast, West Coast thing. You know, we, we have writers we read out here and you guys have writers you read back there and it doesn't always cross over as much as it should. But, you know, what your book showed me is that, you know, all of these same issues that I face as like a ranch woman trying to deal with my neighbors who like roll their eyes when I name my sheep or whatever, you know, <laughs> it's not, it's not such a different world, you know, and that, that, you know, gaslighting and misogyny 
you know, are, are, are just as active among these women who are fighting to take power over their own beauty or their own sense of style, right? Which is an art form. And so that was just a really good set of lessons for me, you know, to, to not be able to dismiss it and say, oh, well, they're buying in because that's not true at all. I mean, in some ways, I think I did that deliberately, right? Because mm -hmm. people have this idea that fashion is kind of flighty and, you know, mm -hmm. superficial or elitist, mm -hmm. but um, it's not really. And in many ways, um, it's, it's, it's very socially conscious mm -hmm. and ahead of the rest of us in mm -hmm. some ways. Mm -hmm. so we've had designers who have like um, the designer for Comme des Garçons, she, she created clothing that was really androgynous mm -hmm. and it was 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, I mean, and, you know, so even though as literary people, we feel like, you know, the pen is mightier than the sword and we make change, um, really a lot of change is a visual. A lot of it is um, in fashion, actually. Um, so I, I thought it was a good challenge and it was a fun one for me because fashion is, has always been something that um, I never really appreciated. Mm -hmm. And then when I started doing research, it was like, oh my God, mm -hmm. this is so fascinating. And especially when I started making shoes, I, you know, I just kind of got addicted. It became like this, this thing where I could just, the rest of me could just fall away and I could just do that. Just be, you know, a shoemaker, just shoe me. Um, you know, I, one of the things that I think that is um, very similar to your book is this whole notion of trauma and um, how trauma plays out, right? And it, it has this like effect long term and, and and people are always like oh something happened just get over it you know like you know your life should be great now right but trauma doesn't really work that way mm -hmm. it always kind of affects you know the things that come later and I felt in your memoir it was so moving because this idea of home goes from this destructive um, environment to this beautiful, expansive home. Mm -hmm. And that was truly beautiful. I mean, just so beautiful. I mean, you have to read the book out there. Everyone, you have to read the book. <laughs> it was fun to write it. It's interesting now, you know, I made this home. I found it. I scratched and clawed to be able to pay for it. I, I don't, I didn't read this part, but just for the audience, um, I sold my first book, Cowboys Are My Weakness. I sold it for $21,000. And when my agent gave me the check for $21,000, she said, don't spend it all on hiking boots. And cause she knew me, right? <laughs> and, uh, and so I didn't, I didn't even cash it. I left grad school where I was making $4,500 a year and I just went driving around the West looking for a place. And when I found this place, my $21,000 was just under 5% down. And the realtor said, you know, Donna Blair, who was the widow who was selling it, he said, Donna Blair is going to like the idea of you. So you give me your 5% down and a signed hardcover copy of Cowboys Are My Weakness and I'll see what I can do. And she agreed to sell it to me. So it's such a like wing and a prayer. Like the whole story is so kind of unbelievable. Um, but it did, you know, everything was on my side once I got out of my father's house, basically. And it's just kind of gone that way since. And so that's one reason I was really happy to write the book to describe the life I've made here in a kind of a detail. But leaving out my childhood didn't work because the ranch wasn't as meaningful without it being the place that I healed, you know, from it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, hi. Hi. <laughs> so we have a few questions in the Q and A 
uh, box. Um, just a reminder to the audience, if you have a question, you can put it in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. We'll get to as many as we can in the next uh, several minutes. So this one is actually a question for both of you um, about the how much you knew about what you wanted to write versus how much you discovered during the process of writing it. So specifically, the question for Christina is how much of the conversation between Amy and her granddaughter did you have worked out? How much did it evolve? Similarly, Pam, how much of the the book in general did you know you wanted to write and how much did you discover as you wrote it? Uh, wow. So um, I guess uh, quickly I'll say that um, I don't actually outline before I write anything, so I it's usually pretty organic. Um, and by organic, I mean I sit down after the kids are asleep and I try to write through the night and and get something like a scene or something and um and i just try to hear the characters uh and what they would say and the rest is is editing um i edit a lot because uh the first go around for me is not necessarily good so i do a lot of editing so i hope that answered the question um, yeah, for me, I don't, I try never to know what I'm doing. <laughs> uh, I always say the three questions I won't let into my writing room are what does it mean? Where is it going? How does it end? Um, I want it to be a process of discovery. I want it to be a surprise. I want it to surprise me. So then it'll surprise the reader. Um, in that particular chapter, that chapter was a lot of fun because it was kind of all the pieces that had fallen out of the other chapters <laughs> that I mashed together. And the two scenes from childhood, when my mother goes to see her dying father and shake his hand, and when my mother shrinks my skirt, <laughs> which is the ultimate move of my mother. Like I've been waiting to put that in a book and it has fallen out of other books, like just naturally, like it just ended up not going, but I was so happy to find a home. You know, my whole computer is just pieces of, I call them glimmers, pieces of stories, but I was so happy to find a home for that skirt scene. And I knew when I wrote about that UV protector that I have to cover the house with. And no matter what I do, I cannot follow the directions, but I have to keep doing it. That and the skirt came together. And I was so happy because they belong together. Like that scene with the, with the skirt has been living in my computer for 25 years. And the UV protector I just wrote for this book. And suddenly there they were, and they went together. They're perfect for each other. And, um, you know, if I explain it, I'll ruin how perfect they are for each other, but they're perfect for each other. So I was very happy that the skirt scene finally found its home. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this question's for Christina. Can you talk a little bit more about when you started designing boots and shoes? Oh, um, I started um, designing and making shoes as research for this book because I really didn't know that much about fashion and and while I do have nice, nice boots of my own, I could not fathom how um, a character would eat peanut butter and jelly every single meal for three months to save up for a set of boots. That made no sense to me, but that was this character. And so to understand um, what was so special about, about it, and as well as understand it metaphorically, I took a class and I just never stopped doing it. I just continue to do it now. And COVID has been hell because I have not been able to continue my shoemaking. There you go. That's really interesting. I didn't realize you, you just started doing it for the book. That's mm -hmm. Um, I know the book is so convincing. I mean, <laughs> when I first met Christina, I interviewed her on my own, um, reading series some months ago. And I was so sure she grew up 
in a, I mean, I was so convinced. I mean, I am all, after all these years, I'm still a naive reader, but I was so sure she came from a family of designers and she herself was a designer. I was sure of it. And really I had to keep adjusting. And even tonight again, I had to sort of adjust my brain to the fact that this was not an autobiographical novel because I so read it as one. I was so convinced by it. Yeah, I really did a lot of research. And, uh, <laughs> a lot. <laughs> Um, we just have one last um, question, which is actually a comment. Someone just wanted to say to Pam that they loved your book and loved hearing you read it. They admire your strength, independence, and resilience in learning to live in a remote place on your own and strive and heal. Well, thank you. Thank you to you, whoever you are. Thank you for <laughs> saying that. I appreciate it. I do. It, it's, I will say, just because here we are, here we are. Um, <laughs> here we are in 2020. Uh, it's been a real challenge to be here during this time because it's a super conservative area and people are anti-mask and it's really made me rethink. Like, I mean, this is such a writerly thing to say and it'll probably make people sad, but like, I'm so glad I got the book in case I have to leave. <laughs> and that's the truth. Like I might be on to the next adventure after this because it's been it's been, um, I really feel like I'm not near anyone of my own kind. And so it's been hard. It's honestly been hard in a way. I, it never was when I was like going off and doing my writing things and then coming home and holding up and writing. Like then it seemed like a great place to live. But now that I'm here all the time and people are really angry and, and, and not being intelligent about taking care of themselves and each other, it's hard, it's hard. So I don't know if I'll be here forever now. I would have said so, but I'm not sure. But thank you for saying that. Whatever I do next will be another adventure if it's not here. You know, this is like, um, I, I have to say, this is like kind of like a dream, like for me, um, because many years ago when I was just beginning to write and thought, well, maybe I could entertain this idea of being a writer. Uh, you know, I was just out of college. Um, I was working this job in, in an internship and um, I picked up uh, cowboys and I thought, wow, I want, I, want, I want to write like this. I want the guts like this to just write like this. And I can't believe I'm here with you reading. It's, I just so, I'm so grateful to you, Pam. Thank you. Well, Thank you for inviting me. It's my pleasure. And I will say this too, because we're in 2020, you know, so much of my life now is dedicated. I mean, I always think of what Toni Morrison said. I think of it every day. You know, if you find yourself with some station in life, you have to reach down and pull somebody else up. And one of the reasons that I'm so dedicated to my teaching is because there's so many young people. I was Tommy Orange's teacher. You know, there's so many young people who have so many things to say right now. And our hope in the world is their books and their ideas and their stories. And so um, getting to know you and, you know, doing what little I can to bring attention to this book has just been really rewarding for me too. I love the book and I'm glad we know each other and I'm glad we got to do this together too. I haven't read from Deep Creek in many months, so that was fun too. It's such a good book. It's really, you really have to get it if you, ha if you don't have it. It's so good. Well, thank you both once again. Thank you to Christina and Pam. Thank you to everyone who thank you. joined the, uh, <laughs> the presentation today. Um, I personally really enjoyed the conversation. Um, please learn more about these wonderful books and you can find the links to purchase them in the chat, which I'll just post one more time here. Um, on behalf of Harvard Bookstore here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, have a good night, keep reading and please be well, everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.